John Boy. John. Lessons from the screen, what we mean is we go through Different documentaries to tell you what they gon' do Give you our lessons, give them our blessings If they trash, we tell you, there is no second guessing Knowledge is power, but time is precious And we're here to keep you running with lessons So sit back as we groove, giving you the review So you only spend time on the docs that you need to Welcome back to another episode of Lessons from the Screen The show where we give you a review of whether or not any particular information that you can get through any particular screen of any particular kind is worth your time. We waste our time, our energy, and our brain power so that you don't have to. You're welcome. Lessons from the screen is sponsored by Pack Sync, a black activist, advocacy, and think tank with the purpose of increasing the quality of life for black people in America through education, culture shift, and economics. As always, you can check them out at www.pactsinc.org. That's packsync.org. Drop a donation, leave a comment, leave a review, scroll through the Learning Center, volunteer, uh, take a survey, whatever you want to do, become a member. Do what you can to support them because they're doing what they can to support you. We are always at a critical juncture in history. And that is one of the deeper lessons of history that you don't really get to understand until you start connecting the dots between major past events and the minuscule things that precede them. There is more to learn in some cases, just some cases, from the long and peaceful periods of history, aka the boring bits, than there is to learn in the eventful war field periods. History is fluid, as is the present and the future, ever changing based on the actions of the present and the perceptions of the future. And that being said, we find ourselves at a critical juncture in history. You see, for the last 30 years, we have been engaging in an increasingly hostile political environment that seems to have been pushed over the edge by two events, the election of Barack Obama and the subsequent election of Donald Trump. Both of these events trigger massive exponential increases in political incivility not seen since the years before the War of Secession. And I refuse to call it a civil war because it was not a civil war because the South had actually succeeded. They were their own nation. A civil war is when two people of the same nation are fighting against each other. The South was their own nation. It was not a civil war. It was the war of secession. Anyways, that was off topic, but whatever. Back on to the topic, contrary to popular opinion, it wasn't the war that changed politics to be more civil. It was the Compromise of 1877. And that brings us to the point of this show. Is democracy dying? And if it is, why are we so willing to kill it? A more timely book couldn't have been produced than the one Steve Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt released in January of this year. A book that, at its core, takes a look at democracies across the globe and analyzes how they transform into authoritarian states. It does this in a very comparative and analytical way, bringing every discussion back to what we see in America today. In this episode of Lessons from the Screen, we will be taking a look at how democracies this book that was published in january of 2018 is about democracy and the culture that is required to maintain it in it the authors argue that democracy is fragile and that the american people have not always had democracies back it actually makes the point that in most circumstances the majority rules pure democracy that we have all been educated to believe exists would end up destroying democracy and so our representative democracy was put in place to prevent that from happening the book goes from the crafting of the constitution through to the first year of trump's administration making comparisons to other democracies that have fallen while also 
talking about how things have changed politically in America. From the culture of American politics to the mechanics of the party system and their roles as gatekeepers. It talks about the necessary acceptability of the legitimacy of adversarial royal views, meaning that Republicans need to see Democrats as legitimate patriots in America instead of seeing them as criminals that need to be destroyed. And the same is true vice versa. Democrats need to see Republicans, and we don't want to use these labels because these labels get confusing because the parties have swapped ideologies in the past. So similar to conservatives viewing progressives as legitimate, progressives also have to view conservatives as legitimate patriots that simply have an alternate worldview, but ultimately want what's best for the country. and. That is an interesting thing that this book chooses to point out because that particular view has been challenged very, very heavily over the past few decades. And at this point, it seems to have corroded entirely. And we, we, we make that point, not only us, but it was also made in the book. When you look at, here we are two years after the election, and they're still talking about locking up Hillary Clinton. You see people in the comment sections of various videos talking about conservatives or liberals needing to be banished from the country, needing to be locked up, needing to be executed. It doesn't seem like the acceptability of the legitimacy of another person's viewpoint is still in place. Seems like that was killed off. And I'd be willing to bet that that was, well, it started to be killed off during the 90s especially during the clinton years it was continued to be murdered during the bush era the barack obama era saw it literally literally be shot in the head literally it, it just died during the obama era and now it's not even a zombie at this point. Like it, like the memory of it seems to have been forgotten during the Trump era. So that is an interesting point and one that should be harped on and one that they do spend a great deal harping on in the book. Now, it also speaks to another thing that is necessary to protect democracy. And that is forbearance. And it spends a good deal of time talking about forbearance as well. And forbearance is basically restraint. It is the ability to not use the full power of your position to, to get what you want, especially if what you want to do is to destroy your political opposition. So you have the tools. Take impeachment, for instance, a very powerful tool in which Legis the legislative branch can clear out the executive branch. Very, very, very powerful tool. It has only been used two times in American history, one time successfully. So that's, and we're talking about a 200 plus year history. It's only been, it's been used less than three times. That is extraordinary forbearance. The ability to do something but just because you have the ability to do it doesn't mean you should do it. And we've seen that go out of the window as well in the modern era of win at any cost politics. And basically, once you win and acquire power, the era of do whatever it takes to hang on to that power politics. And it points out countless examples of this at play. Probably the most obvious example being the Senate refusing to even hold a hearing to confirm President Obama's executive, executive power to appoint a Supreme Court justice. Never in the history of America has a Congress refused to even hold a hearing until President Obama and his Supreme Court justice.
So that was a great example. And it talks, the book also talks about how these soft rails, which are the cultural norms of politics in America, are being eroded and how they are necessary institutions in order to protect democracy. Because without these soft rails, the spirit of the law is removed. And when you remove the spirit of the law, the law is left to be open to vast interpretations. And any number of those vast interpretations could be used to destroy the letter of the law itself. So that's why it becomes significant when we start seeing all of these political norms being broken. A lot of us are under the impression that there's no harm, no foul, as long as you're not breaking the law. But if you're breaking the spirit of the law and by violating political norms, oftentimes, even though the letter of the law isn't being broken, the spirit is, you're putting the system at risk. And the authors do a great job of conveying these messages, conveying these points. Now, there are several big takeaways from this book. But I'm only going to speak to two of them that directly deal with our community. And the first is the dramatic effect of the 1877 compromise that effectively ended Reconstruction. And for those that don't know, Reconstruction was the period of time just after the, the War of Succession when the federal government had troops stationed in the South to ensure the fair treatment of black people by the southern slave owners, the former slave owners. And they set up all of these equal op equal opportunity offices and government offices and things of that nature to ensure that the resources were provided to help these people get on their feet and to ensure that they weren't disenfranchised in any way and that they had all of the rights afforded to them as citizens of America. Eight, the eight, 1877 compromise effectively ended that. And it effectively ended black enfranchisement and replaced it with black disenfranchisement now the need for the compromise was that even though the war had ended and the north won it conquered the south and reun reunified the united states politically there was still great contention in america and that contention was largely being driven by the fact that these now franchised black people were voting and they were voting in liberals they were voting in progressives they were voting in black people to political office and that was an issue and it was a a a, a very 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 tense and sore issue that prevented the country from fully reunifying in a way that it had been prior to the war. And so the 1877 compromise was essentially liberal, liberal whites saying to conservative whites, fine, we will let you do whatever you want to do with those black people down there. As long as you get on board with the United States experiment and allow us to move forward. At which point the Southern whites said, all right, cool, we could do that. And so the major lesson here is a lesson that we've seen again and again and that we're currently seeing now in America with regards to progressive politics. And at this point, the progressives are the Democrats. At the time, the progressives were the Republicans. But we see this now at this juncture in American history where you're seeing Democratic strategists saying that the Democratic problem is that they're playing identity politics and that they don't have a message for the core white voter. And that is essentially saying that we need another compromise of 1877. Now we need a compromise of 2018 or 2019 or of 2020. My personal view on what happened politically is that it was a white lash. You don't, there was nothing inherently wrong with the Democratic message. 
their voters are concentrated in cities, metropolitan areas. And a lot of this country is still rural. But there was nothing wrong with their message. That's proven by the fact that they generated more votes than the conservatives did. They were just all clustered together, which is why they lost the Electoral College. They only won 20 of the 30, 20 of the 50, 50 states. The Republicans won 30. So there was nothing wrong with the message, in my opinion. They could have added some things to the message if they really wanted to appeal to the white core demographics. But essentially, when you have a man saying, a man that is embroiled in sexual allegations at the midst, during, the, during the, the, the midst of the Me Too movement, and is talking down on people and this, that, and the third, and he still gets a sizable portion of the white woman vote. There's nothing you can do at that point. And I don't think there's anything you should be trying to do at that point, because at that point, what's at play and what's driving the votes is something that your party should not, should not stand for and should not be moving towards. But again, going back to my original point, we are seeing calls for a new compromise, which would say abandon the black people, abandon the Mexican people, abandon Hispanic people in general, abandon black and brown peoples as a whole. And to an extent, because the Christian evangelical base has joined into the Republican Party to an extent, abandon the LGBTQ community. Abandon all of these minority groups and try to become more of what the white demographic would like us to be, would like you to be, and everything will smooth over. The Republic, they're essentially saying if you, we want to stay active and compete with the Republican Party, we need to become more like the Republican Party. And you can't tell me that that isn't a very close look at what the compromise of 1877 was. So I say all that to say we have got to get out of this mindset of thinking that somebody is going to come to our rescue because time and time again, we have seen that it's not going to happen. If you want to be saved, you have to save yourself. And there are plenty of ways to do that, even using the political system, the political establishment to help you do it. But you've got to get involved in that system in order to manifest those changes yourself. You cannot count on other people involved in that system that don't know what you go through, that don't look like you, that don't know what you experience on a daily basis to affect those changes for you because they don't have the necessary understanding or the necessary will or desire to do so. Now, the second thing I want to point out, the second big takeaway for the black community, especially in this, is the effect that the 1877 compromise had on black people as voters something that we still have not recovered from you see prior to the compromise and after the end of the war black people started turning out voting in massive numbers roughly 90 percent of black people turned out to vote we were effectively voting the conservative party into extinction after the 1877 compromise when they started implementing the black codes and started putting all of these poll taxes and all of these other obstacles in the path of black voters our voter turnout dropped to less than 10 percent less than five percent and we still have not recovered from that and they still have not given up the advantage that was created by that because the south is still solidly conservative and it became that during those years of repressing black people and disenfranchising black people and black people have never again started voting we have still not recovered faith in the system from what happened to us after the 1877 compromise and i'm not saying we need to have faith in the system i'm black just like everybody else and if I'm speaking honestly, I don't have a whole lot of faith in the system either. But I do recognize the need 
for black people to participate in the system in whatever capacity that we can manage to participate. All of us don't have to be voters. Voters, Political action is much deeper than voting. So for those of you that are ex-cons that can't vote, that's no excuse not to be politically active. For those of you that for whatever reason you have decided personally not to vote, that's fine if that's what you want to do. But that is not an excuse not to find other ways of being politically active because the system is set up in such a way that if one person votes, all the people that did not vote have just handed their power to that one person. The system is not set up in such a way that you can protest the system and cause it not to function. If one person votes, the system functions. And so by us choosing not to be politically active, we are handing over all of our political power to other interest groups that don't share our desire or our viewpoints. And again, I'm saying be politically active. I am not saying vote because honestly, I think before you vote, there is a level of knowledge that you should have on the process and the candidates. I am not a fan of ignorant voters or of ignorant voting or of voting against something. You vote for something. I'm not a fan of any of those scenarios. So in a lot of cases, I actually agree with people that say that they don't vote, especially when I find out that they don't follow politics either. Good. Don't vote. It's in everybody's best interest that you not vote. But you can still be politically active. You can still lobby. You can still create uh, legislation. You can still call your representatives. You can still send emails. You can still get involved. There's still a plethora of other things you can do to be politically active outside of voting. Control where you spend your money. Your dollars is another form of voting. But we have not recovered from the impact of the 1877 compromise. And it had a dramatic effect on us politically. A dramatic effect on us politically. And when I'm talking about voting, here's the other thing with that. A lot of us don't really think about prior to the 1877 compromise, there were black people winning congressional seats. There were black people taking control of local politics. I'm not talking about presidential elections. I'm not even in a lot of cases talking about um, federal congr Congress. We're talking about state legislators. We're talking about governors. We're talking about mayors. We're talking about these particular seats, these local politicians that have an extreme amount of power over your day to day life, wherever you live locally. Get involved on that level and watch it work its way up. Even for those of us who want to create safe spaces, it becomes very, very difficult to do that if you can't politically defend your space. If someone else can come into your space, take all of your political power and then begin to make the rules and dictate and make mandates as they see fit. It's not your space. Understanding the political game is just as important as understanding the economic game because po politics is the means by which power becomes stabilized in the hands of those that have it. Politics is also the means by which those that don't have power can acquire power provided they understand the system and they play the game correctly. On the whole, this was a great book. Great book. And it is definitely required reading, in my opinion, for anybody that wants to be politically engaged or for anybody that wants to get politically engaged in the climate we're in. The audio book is about eight and a half hours to get through. 
and the actual book is about 320 330 pages but it is filled with relevant and powerful information the book does have a progressive lean to it a liberal lean to it so if you're a conservative reading the book well if you're a conservative i don't really know if you'd be listening to me but if you are a conservative reading the book um take that into account there there are going to be things that are going to be said that is going to frustrate you such as when they make the claim that republicans started this push and when they make the claim that even though democrats have continued things going the republicans are largely to blame for our current heading if you're a republican or a conservative that's going to be disappointing to hear but it is a good book nonetheless even with the the obvious bias and slant definitely required reading thank you for tuning in i hope you enjoyed it leave me a comment let me know what you think as always website www.freedomtrainradio.com get the app the app is available and i look forward to seeing you next week for the next episode of lessons from the screen Lessons from the screen, what we mean is we go through Different documentaries to tell you what they gon' do Give you our lessons, give them our blessings If they trust we tell you, there is no second guessing Knowledge is power, but time is precious And we're here to keep you from them Lessons, so sit back as we groove Give you the review, so you only spend time on the docs that you need to once again, I want to thank you for tuning in to Lessons from the Screen. Lessons from the Screen is brought to you by Paxing through the Freedom Train Network. You can find us on www.freedomtrainradio.com or on iTunes, Google Play Music, or Stitcher. Be sure to head to one of those places and leave us a review, and then be sure to head back to the website to let us know what you think about the show and communicate with us. Also, be sure to head to www.packsync.org and show some love and support for our sponsors. PackSync is doing big things in the community and trying to do more, always trying to do more. So be sure to head to the website. That's www.packsync.org. Donate, volunteer, become a member, talk about it, whatever. They can use your support. And once again, they are doing great things in the community. And as always, Lessons from the Screen has a frame of reference and perspective that is aligned with that of the black community. The things that we look at, whether it be on the Trending Tuesday or the regular Lessons from the Screen show, will always be looked at from the black perspective. So keep that in mind because we need more minds shaped into that perspective and trying to do things that we need done for ourselves. So with that in mind, again, thank you guys for listening again. Remember to tune in to the Freedom Train Radio. We have the app that's available that you can get from the website. It's in the Google Play Store. Sorry, it's not available on iTunes yet. We have the live internet radio. And we have more shows coming up. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I will see you guys on Thursday for the next episode of Lessons from the Screen.